So I was really looking forward to this. Um, um, all you are, some of you know about the DAO. Some of you have been around during the time. Some of you have read something from some source, and there's a lot of good information, a lot of wrong information around. So my goal today is actually to just tell you the story from my perspective. So what basically happened, um, without going into too much details in this um, short time, I've not prepared any slides, so I just try to tell you the story how I remember it. It's almost three years ago. Um, it was a very interesting time. So let's maybe start with um, 2014, when I started working for the Ethereum Foundation. I was mostly working on tests, so testing that all the client implementations were true to the yellow paper, the technical specification. So security was, of course, my number one goal. That's what was I was doing. You could say I was trying to avoid hard forks in some, to some extent, trying to say that all those clients were compatible with each other. And at the end of 2015, um, Stefan Tual, who was the chief communication officer of Ethereum, um, who's responsible for a lot of the community building and especially all the meetups which has happened afterwards, um, joined us. And my brother, Simon Jens, we created Slocket. 2016, there was no real ICO run or anything like what you saw 2017 or later. Actually, you, if you could say Ethereum was something like an ICO or crowd sale, Augur was the next one. And we had this idea of connecting devices to the blockchain so people could pay in order to use them. So some of you may remember DEF CON 1, we showed a nice door lock and how you could pay to open it and basically apply it to something like a decentralized Airbnb or something in this direction. So when we had this idea, actually the first presentation was in summer 2014, New York, with Joe Lubin, and we thought about how do we fund this and speak about DAOs, speak about ICOs. The Back then, I thought was, well, we could do something like an ICO or token. And the story was really, I was writing the smart contract. Um, back then, ERC-20 token just started to be discussed. And I thought, well, we have Ethereum now. Ethereum is so powerful. I feel a bit bad just doing a token. I mean, we can do much, much more. Let's give those people power over what we do so that we have, um, they can vote on what we do with the money. Um, then later I said, well, that's not enough because that even if they roll, we don't have to do it because the money is already with us if you would have gone this way. So we said, let's keep the money in the smart contract and then we make a proposal to get some out of it. So that would be, they would in be in control, but we would be the only one receiving it. After further discussing this with our co-founders and this, the community, like there was starting a crowd on Slack of about 5,000 people, we said, let's open this up completely. Everybody can put money in everybody can make a proposal to get something out. So it would only be there to, you could say, I don't know if it's the right word to say, bootstrapping the system, but more like writing the smart contract, writing the paper, giving the idea out, but then step back and see if we maybe would get, get some money out of the DAO or not. So this was actually a thought process, how we arrived there. This was not like we started out, uh, let's build a DAO. Um, then there was a very, a lot of, lot of pressure on us. Just Think about, it was around this time, actually, three years ago, we didn't have much money. We went like six months without any salary. And this, that was before Ether was any, anything near what it, what it was today. And, so, and we had about five or 6,000 people on Slack asking every day, when will the contract be deployed? When is the DAO ready? And I was coding there and feeling like a wipe behind me, faster, do faster. But we also had good contributions. We had about 18 people contributing to the code itself. And I remember, of course, security was, the, was always in my mind. I thought about what can we do? Um, we had excellent advisors. Um, I tried to speak with them. But of course, we also did a security audit. We actually uh, tried to find a company who could do this. So the only company in my mind was actually Deja Vu in Seattle. There was other, this is a company which audited the Ethereum clients. So I actually flew to Seattle, got an audit there, said everything looks good, no bugs. Great. <laughs> so coming back, um, again, it was open source. Everybody looked at it again and again and said, I think it's done, but I want to do more tests. In the end, I just tested, does the split DAO function work? So can people get their money out again in case something does go wrong? Do, do proposals work? So if something goes wrong, we can deploy a new contract, make a proposal to put all the money into the new one, and this could fix problems. So the main things, they actually work. We had full test coverage. I still felt very, very nervous. And so, but at some point I said, there's not much more I can do at this point. Um, it felt like I, 
uh, looking at this code for days and days. We had m many people look at it, so I released the version 1.0, and this is about the point when Slogger said, now we are done. We have a white paper, we have the version 1.0, let's see what the community does with it. This was basically the story then. Um, so you know what happened, to our very big surprise, um, of course, many people deployed DAOs. That's also an important thing. We call this thing DAO framework, and there are many DAOs deployed according to this framework, but of course only one really took off. So people put money in, and way, way, way more than we expected. I mean, nobody expected 14% of all Ether, or roughly $150 million, depending on the Ether price. Actually, the price of Ether went up, that at some point it actually holds something like $220 million. So this was something very scary. And those people who have been around me at the time, I mean, there's Griff, I mean, he may be somewhere in the audience. Um, I was basically mentally at my limit. <laughs> I was not wanting to talk to anybody, like press was calling every day, New York Times coming and made an article about us. And then they made another article and complained about me not res responding because I was just not responding my emails for one day. So it was a very negative article then because I didn't answer his questions so much pressure. I actually took about two weeks off and tried to not go on social media and anything, so it was way, way, way too much. I was just a developer. What have I done? <laughs> this was my, my feeling, like this was not what was planned. But well, now we are here, so let's try to make the best of it. Um, there was then the paper coming out from Flat Semvian, and Emin Gun Zero about some game theoretical flaws, how there was a bias towards yes and other things. We are trying to fix those problems in the code so we could release a version 1.1 so people could move then towards this. Um, this was the start. Maybe to give you a quick overview of what the DAO code actually did. So the DAO code was very, very simple. It just had a contract where there was a token contract, standard ERC20. Then one contract inherited from this just create tokens where you could put Ether in and get DAO tokens out. Very simple. And a refund function in, ca in the case of uh, we wouldn't reach a minimum limit, which you didn't need. And then there was the DAO contract itself. And the problem back then was the block gas limit was only 3.14 million. So I couldn't put much in to deploy the contract at once. So we put in just make creating a proposal, executing a proposal. This was just tallying the votes, and if more yes than no, and if a minimal quorum of about 20% was reached, then the transaction would be executed. And this is mostly it. And we had a set of curators. Their um, power was to create a whitelist or put addresses on there which could receive funds. It was something like a failsafe, but you could also say it was a centralized element in the DAO itself. Um, certainly first version. And this also brings the point, that there are many things we are missing, like a really good user interface, um, better explanations, maybe a le legal structure behind it. We always had this question, should we as Slocket do all of those things? Um, it needs to be there at some point, but at which point do you start releasing the codes, to, so to say? How do you bootstrap a decentralized system without being in charge? This was, I think, the biggest problem we had this at this point. So we said, well, even the name of the DAO itself so that we cannot decide a name, the community needs to do this. That's why the DAO was just a placeholder and people intended to vote on the name later on. And even the legal structure, there was a lawyer who said, I can make a proposal to the DAO to set uh, up um, a limited liability company in Switzerland or somewhere else which would represent them. Um, but we said, well, let's do this later. Once the DAO exists, you can make a proposal and if they want to, they can. But the token holders are always in charge. This was always the uh, mindset we had in the time. Well, then you know what happened. Um, in somewhere around the beginning of July, um, there was this re-entrancy bug which got exploited. I always think about why I didn't find it, but well, I think I was just mentally not in the stage of finding those little things anymore. And I was actually about two weeks on, on a break, didn't look at the code for this time. Then my brother was calling me at like Friday morning, eight o'clock, and saying something strange is happening. Just look at the blockchain explorer. Some irregular, like always money is going out. So you could just see how the money was flowing out. You could do nothing. There was no governance on top of the DAO except of the DAO token holders could vote for proposals, but this would take two weeks. So too long. So there was no emergency button, no shutting something down. We had no control over it whatsoever. So we of course talked to the Ethereum Foundation people, to developers and to many others. But here you could feel what Ethereum governance was like, um, because there was no formal governance at Ethereum, of course. So who could decide? Who could decide for a hard fork? Who would decide which code to use? And 
This was a total disaster or mess the next five or six weeks. I felt like I was trying to orchestrate something without any power. So of course our hope was we just wanted that everybody got their money back and then this capital is closed <laughs> for me. This was our goal, of course. And so we spoke with the miners, we spoke to others, they made a vote uh, for the soft fork. Most miners were in favor of it, but there was a DDoS vulnerability found, so it was canceled. <laughs> they made about four weeks left. So I remember talking, speaking with people from the foundation, they said, well, we, we can't do a decision here, we can't speak about it, so we can't really do much. Of course, they were very helpful, um, as much as they could. Um, then you speak to the core developers, if they want to implement, or the option of a hard fork, you say, well, if my boss tells me, speak to the boss, he's on vacation, he doesn't want to speak about it, he doesn't want to get in touch, so what to do? So someone put up a carbon vote, if you remember those days. So some people voted, and those who did vote, they were mostly in favor of a hard fork, miners and also users. Um, but of course, it was only a small fraction of them. But this at least gave a, a good enough reason for the developers to implement the option of a hard fork. I wrote the technical specification back then, was implemented, and actually at this day went through very smoothly. So I remember this day, there was no Ethereum Classic at the, at the day of the hard fork, or not in, in our minds at least. Um, of course, the day after I got very weird emails from people wanted to buy my old Ether from the old chain for one cent per <laughs> token. There were really strange things happening with those exchanges back then. And then three days later, Barry Silbert pushed for ETC on Polen Polenex, Poloniex, and so on, which is fine. Everybody can do in this ecosystem what they want. It's an opt-in system. People can opt into ETC or ETH. I have no bad feelings whatsoever. Completely also understand their reasonings. And well, but this was just telling the story from what I observed. Um, it was a very um, tense time, of course. I had... Um, how many children did I have back then? I have six children right now. I think back then it was four or five. So <laughs> uh, you have still a lot of things to do at home. They want to get fat. You have didn't have a salary for six months. And just people pushing you to work, work, and work without any payment, of course. The DAO was not giving us any money. We did hope for making a proposal as Slocket to get paid by them in the future. But of course, this doesn't happen. And of course, not after the hard fork. So this was a very, very challenging time. So. I think I covered most of the story itself, so maybe let's get to some lessons learned. At DEF CON 2, I spoke about smart contact security. This was the talk right after the DAO. I was advised not to talk about the DAO, unfortunately. I didn't want to, but it told me not to. But for several reasons, and I can also understand them. Um, but actually, here's my first chance to really speak to this community about it, because I didn't really get a chance before. So. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> and you are actually the ones now pushing this topic forward. And I, I really feel for what you're doing. We learned, of course, smart contact security is one of the most critical and important things. And I think since the, in the last three years or two and a half years, a lot of things have been done in this topic. We have there are we are years ahead, like in terms of best practices, in terms of tools. Then LLL came out. LLL was great. So I wrote those <laughs> contracts in LLL. And then Solidity came out. And I was like, this is much better. So it's now so easy to write smart contracts. And, but then, of course, we learned from experience um, the EVM contracts today, how much things can go wrong, what you need to watch out for. And people think, well, what could we have done differently? A lot of things. I mean, there were game theoretical flaws in the DAO contract, technical flaws, actually many of them. But if you don't know what to look for in an audit, you ca just can't find it. Now people know about re-entrancy, and they're looking for those things in an audit, and they find those issues, of course. Back then, this was just something not in our mind. Um, we looked at things like the stack depth of 1024, which is not an issue anymore. We looked at hitting the block gas limit, having infinite loops or something. We had some kinds of things. I had a checklist for about four or five things, and of course, general best practices in software development. But Today, the best practices list is so much longer, and so I think we are now at a stage where we can look at DAOs again. The, that DAO was way too early for its time. I think many of the stuff we are doing, and actually in the Ethereum ecosystem, has this one big problem of being too early. If you look at the presentations of DEF CON Zero, I've been there, or DEF CON 1 in London, all great stuff, but why didn't it work out yet? It was too early. So, and now we are arriving at a time 
where smart contract security has reached a stage where we can dare to do such a thing again, but of course still be very, very careful, step by step, putting a cap inside and many, many other things. Um, we have a community now who much better understands what's going on, also on the game theory side, on what options we have in governance, not just a simple vote as we did. You have quadratic voting and you have all those nice tools you have built on top. So I I'm really looking forward to 2019, what the arrogant community or DAO stack and Colony, what all of them are doing um, in terms of where DAO can take us. I think the DAO had one, one bad thing which came afterwards. The good thing was we learned a lot. But then people came and did all those ICOs, and many of them would have done proposals to the DAO, get f money from them. I spoke to many of them, but for security reasons, they just did an ICO and didn't dare to do anything like a DAO or governance, and something in this regard. They all said it's too dangerous. So we had this ICO madness in 2017. And I hope now, after this ICO madness, we come back to our roots when we created Ethereum, when we did all of this, we thought about a world where we have full decentralization, full power of individuals. That's the world we have envisioned, but it's not what we have delivered last year. So I hope now with Aragon making such progress and all those other protocols, we can move again, you could say back to the roots in some way, and not losing our values, creating those decentralized autonomous organizations which fulfill the promises of the early days. So that's what I'm really hoping for, and I hope you and I, of course, will do my best um, to join you in this, um, in, in this effort, can fulfill the promise of Ethereum and DAOs. So I thank you very much for having me here today, and I'm looking forward to work together and build the next generation of DAOs. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>